Um, so you were about to drop some incredible wisdom. I just felt it coming and I thought uh, we should record this and make it part of the podcast series. So we're jumping into that part right now and I just want to pass it right back to you and let you flow with what you're about to flow with. Well, so I'm not sure that it's incredible wisdom, but it was very <laughs> useful to me to look back on my life and realize that very significant events have happened in a year or a decade rather that ends in four. So the first was 84 when I finished school. I mean, that is so long ago. I can't even remember what the world was like at that point. The second was 94 when I helped launch mobile telephony in South Africa. So I was involved in pretty serious technology projects and then got headhunted and went to Sydney, Australia first, but then ended up living in 16 cities on six continents. Then the next wow. decade was 2004, where I had an out of body experience on a beach in Thailand, which in itself was profound. But this, what happened at the same time is I was given a pretty intense, very detailed uh, vision of some kind of future society, the, the kind of thing mm. and outcome we're all working towards right now. That was 2004. Then 2014, along comes a very unannounced and unexpected daughter. As I was saying to you before we started recording, I've avoided having children through two marriages because my worldview, rightly or wrongly, is that the world is a messed up place. And if that's true, why would you want to bring a, a kid into the world? Um, but she announced herself and said, well, here I am. Now what are you going to do about it? So <laughs> next year, 2024, is the year before she turns 21 years old. Um, no, sorry, sorry, uh, 20. Oh, good Lord, I've lost track now. But 2024 is the 20 year anniversary, anniversary of the vision. Right. And 2035 is my daughter's 21st birthday. So 2034 is the year before. But what I've committed to do in my insanity is the mm. best 21st birthday gift that I can give my daughter is a manifestation in some way of that vision that was given to me. Now, one other thing to add to that, when I first came, when I first drove physically into the valley, which I'm now living in, which is, uh, it's called the Valley of Grace. It's 90 minutes outside of Cape Town in South Africa. Um, as I drove in the first time, that same vision that was given to me in 2004 came flashing back to me in the same level of detail, saying that this is the place where it's going to happen. Um, and so since then, all kinds of serendipitous moments and meetings mm. and things have come together, but in profound ways, you know, and I, I know you experienced the same thing. The Seeds community experiences the same thing, but it really has been incredibly profound. Okay, I dive very deep there. Um, Maybe hopefully not that enough. frames um, where, wherever the rest of the call is going to go. Tell me more about this valley and this vision and what's emerging there. So I need to, you know, I need to go back a little bit and contextualize the whole thing. So firstly, I have spent a fair amount of time in the Seeds community. I've spent a lot of time in the systemic change space as in about mm. 15 years i've met incredible people all over the world seeing the most amazing projects and by the time the the pseudo pandemic lockdowns happened i was burnt out of seeing so many incredible things and recognizing that nothing about the system itself changes that's what everybody's strong desire is and you know we we come together we have meetings we have conferences weekend getaways we build technological solutions we uh, lots of immense activity and yet the system today is exactly the same as it was in 2008 when we had the first significant economic meltdown uh and so it led me down well, maybe not even exactly the same probably even worse but anyway Thank you for yes, <laughs> um, but it led you know for me to a personal deep searching process, going, doing lots of inner work and lots of questioning what's happening externally. What mm. is the core issue that we're dealing with, and is there any one thing that can be addressed in in the face of? many you know what what many are calling the poly crisis 
And the, the conclusion after that deep dive was actually there's nothing we could or should be doing. And I got to that point, not from a deep spiritual perspective, but more from a, which is also important, by the way, but we'll get on to that separately later in the call if that's um, relevant. But more specifically, to look at cycles of historical rise and fall of civilizations. Firstly, to realize that what we're experiencing now is part of an oft repeated pattern. Secondly, that there are signs that we can look for to identify where we are in that process. And third, to try and wayfare or navigate our way using history as an example to say, see where we go from this. Um, and, and, and so what we're doing now is backed by historical precedent. So in the valley, there's about 20,000 people here uh, represented by six very different socio-economic human settlements from the very wealthy white um, people that have, you know, they've escaped the city and come and built their little enclave and they're as happy as can be, all the way down to incredibly poor communities with all kinds of social ills, drug addictions, uh, unemployment, uh, loss of hope, you know, all the stuff that we know happens in a class-based civilization. So what mm. we're saying is in this valley of 20,000 people across all these different socioeconomic uh, spreads, can we create, can we replicate what has happened when previous civilizations have collapsed? That's the first, that the bad news is collapse, the good news is emergence. And can we look into history and see what happened and, and replicate that emergence? the essence of which is a return to sovereignty, to self-sufficiency, to a, a reclamation of all the responsibilities that we've abdicated to an external party. And rather say, we're going to be responsible for our own electricity generation, sewage removal, water sanitation, food product, you know, basically, we're now doing this, but then do it in a pretty exciting way so that we're not seem to be going backwards to a subsistence economy taking mm -hmm. into account tokens like seeds uh, looking at new ways of incentivizing human creativity in a really profound and interesting way uh, so bottom line is we're trying to recreate thrivability uh, my personal favorite is vibrancy that's a relatively new term that Charles Eisenstein recently used in one of his newsletters. I like that phrase, vibrant. Um, mm. But, but you know, really do it this time as opposed to talking about it. And I, I know in the SEEDS community, many initiatives have been spun off with that intention. And then you hit the hard wall of reality saying, ah, this takes <laughs> healthy inflows of all the different forms of capital uh, and we can't quite get that right. So the program that I'm pulling together is to say, how do we address that very significant uh, shortfall in the space where all of us can see clearly the outcome that we want, and yet we're still operating in a world that wants to stop us from doing that. Let me stop there because I rambled quite a bit. <laughs> no, no, no rambling. Uh, um. A few quick responses that I'd love to just get update you on, at least as far as my journey has been. Mm. Um, I kind of see probably the vision that you're holding, that so many of us is holding. I call that like yeah. the other side of a bridge, if you will. So it's another mm -hmm. island. Our current paradigm is one island. Um, whenever you build a bridge, you build support structures on both sides of the chasm, and then you build the bridge across, right? Um, I very much see seeds as the support structure on the current side, the current side we're on, because it's using all the same concepts that are the problem. You know, how do we incentivize good behavior, et cetera? It's always, it's still extrinsic motivations, it's still extrinsic rewards. It's still, you know, representative democracy and that sort of thing. Um, Why well, at least the vision I'm holding on what the other side looks like is less like self-sufficiency, but it is regeneration because regeneration is relationship. And relationship is having a relationship with yourself, which means healing. 
um, which I think is something that so many groups have just forgot about. It's like, hey, we're actually, we're going to get triggered. We have all of our traumas. Like, that is the point. Like, this isn't something for us to, like, push to the shadows or pretend like it doesn't exist or to, you know, <laughs> try to mitigate. Um, this is what we want to go through. Because you talked about, like, the, you know, the rich people who have escaped to the uh, the valley there. I don't think they're happy. Science says they're not happy. Statistics shows that they're not happy. They're just as sick as everyone else. So like if we get on the same page and say, look, our depression, our anxiety, our illness is because we're disjointed. So we need to go on a healing journey. Um, so we got to like realize we're all in this in, in one lens. Um, have you have you heard of Anastasia before, the Siberian recluse living? Yep. Okay. So she talks about the Vedic culture and what their civilization looked like. Uh, I don't think there's a return to that because they got destroyed by the, you know, fear-based culture. Yep. Okay. So what her culture was, just a quick recap. Um, there was family domains where you were born in this domain where that family had a direct relationship with all the animals and plants in that area. And you can imagine it's like a permaculture food forest, every one of them. There wasn't, uh, you know, you're working and slaving every day to get food. Food was grown in abundance all on its own with all the animals doing all the work for them. You know, they had trained squirrels to collect all the nuts and shell them for them. They had trained eagles to like fly their children up in the air. They had trained bears to like dig up things and roots and tubers and store them for the winter. Like they had trained all the animals that then teach their kids <laughs> to do it all for them. Like, so their entire life was like, all of our basic needs are already met. Now, what do we want to do with our time? So their whole civilization was a love-based civilization. It was always about you know, cultivating love, facilitating love, building festivals around love. Everything was love-based, um, which obviously makes them terrible at warfare, <laughs> even though they were still great at it. They hold, held off the Romans for freaking centuries. Um, even like Caesars and a bunch of you know rulers of Rome were like very afraid of the, you know, the pagans of the north. Um, but anyway point is that they still got <clears throat> conquered by the, the fear-based civilizations that we're operating in right now. So I think yeah. that's the real kind of the chasm that we need to, you know, understand here is we have this fear extrinsic incentive driven culture where there's an outside influence acting on us. You know, Daniel Schmachtenberger and others call this Moloch and they've like really unpacked what Moloch looks like where it's like in, in encouraging us to do messed up things <laughs> you know seeds is kind of still in that lens it was still you know how do we shift extrinsic motivations you know like we realize this is a reality like how do we shift the the direction i still think that plays a part but you know where i'm at now and i think maybe where you're closer to now is like wanted to teleport myself to the other side of that chasm and start building the support structures on the other side and then I think when we connect them, that's where the beauty happens. Because so many projects have been operating on, you know, the new paradigm side, if you will, without any resources, without support, without ability to buy more land. They're constantly in this like fundraising mode, you know, constantly feeling scarcity. So it's like, you know, they didn't have that bridge where all the resources could flow through. So that's kind of the, the stage I'm at right now is what does that bridge look like and need to look like? that mm -hmm. can drive the extrinsic motivations in, but realizing once we get across it, it's not about that anymore. It's not a civilization based on extrinsic motivations. It's a civilization based off our intrinsic motivations. What's really gonna nourish us, heal us, you know, and those internal drives that biology has been giving us since we were, you know, evolved and we've been on this planet is what's really gonna guide us towards the healing that, you know, our earth needs to go on right now. Last yep. thing I wanted to share, super relevant, is we're not alone in this. Like all of the conversations are forgetting all the other species and animals on our planet that want to help us with this crisis too, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So way too much of it is focused on what humans need to do. And we're not really looking at all the other animals that want to be part of this transition and will help us, you know, if we allow them. Um, anyhow, so that's kind of the lenses I'm playing with now. And I just want you to reflect back and yeah. What do you think? feel sense Beautiful. so i mean i would add to the non-human species not only animals but i do believe that there are angelic or spiritual beings uh depending on what your uh, belief system is that are absolutely ready to help us and there's plenty of scientific evidence of that which we can delve into but if i may just to backtrack a little bit to the anastasia story um, mm. which I sometimes find a little too much of a novel setting, as in it's non-fiction. 
Um, there's lots of meaning behind it, but there is an equivalent, in my view, absolutely non-fiction version of that story, which is the Hanseatic League, which is a group of Northern European um, um, seafaring tradesmen that established a very healthy trade route as the remnants of the Roman Empire, or more specifically the Byzantine Empire, was busy collapsing. So the playground was in the Mediterranean Sea for the Roman Empire that started stagnating over a thousand years. It took a thousand years for that empire to finally uh, disappear with the fall of Constantinople. And while that was going on, the Hanseatic League established something similar to what uh, Anastasia was talking about, which is a vibrant, healthy ecosystem of incredible stuff. But the point of all of it is that it led to huge creativity that triggered mm. the European Renaissance with art and you know all kinds of creative activity that hadn't been seen as the Roman Empire and Byzantine Empire was collapsing. So if not if, when we get this right, you will absolutely see that spurt of creativity. Uh, and, and that's what leads to what I think Eisenstein is talking to as, as vibrant life on a vibrant planet. So we've got a way still to go with that. Um, and whether it's in extrinsic or intrinsic motivation, I'm not sure it matters. When you get living conditions right, uh, you get that burst of creativity. And the European Renaissance created, you know, that's what led to Gutenberg Press, eventually the Industrial Revolution. It triggered a huge mm. leap in human progress with unintended consequences, which we're very, very aware of. But the point is that it was a huge leap forward. And when we trigger that create level of creativity again, we will see another huge leap forward. And that's the way evolution happens. So we, we're kind of, you know, we're finding ourselves in the midst of some pretty dark and dismal days. And yet we are at the cusp of an unbelievable breakthrough. And so what we try and do is create the ecosystem where we can stimulate those levels of conversation, that level of creativity, and specifically bring healthy value flows flowing in. Uh, because mm. many of the regenerative projects I've been involved in have struggled with that healthy value flow coming in. Uh, so let me break that. How does that sit with you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think what Anastasia is talking about is totally nonfiction. Um, however, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm fully with you. And uh, there's something else super fascinating as we talk about, you know, circling around the evolutionary leap forward is that when living beings are stressed, they recreate more viruses. Viruses mm -hmm. being just information packets of what we're capable, you know, what our DNA is capable of expressing. So there's just more potential for the expression of life. Um, after every great extinction, we saw a huge up flourishing of new species that never existed before. You know, so I think that's what we're living through right now is we're going through an extinction. We're also increasing the level of viruses across the world, so we're increasing the potential information. Um, simultaneously, we're digging up all the carbon and throwing it in the air, so now we have more building blocks for new life to exist. You know. The heating of the planet is melting the ice caps. Now there's more water in the atmosphere. So we've just added all of the ingredients for a new burst of life to like really express itself on the planet. So I think that's kind of where we're at in this crisis moment, which is fascinating and really interesting. Um, but yeah, uh, value flows. I think that's exactly where we're at. And I think a lot of that also has to do with the healing because a lot of the value flows have been disrupted because of this us first them stories. Yeah. You now, like, you know, the heart thinks it's better than the brain so that they're at war with each other or something, <laughs> you know, the eco village thinks it's better than the bankers on wall street. So, you know, or vice versa, or whatever. And it's always kind of been that story, at least in these collapsing civilizations. So I think that's really the first place of trying to heal and maybe what's, you know, possible of happening in the Valley and what we're trying to do here is weave together all these disparate groups that need each other. 
they might not realize yet that they need each other. You know, the retirement communities that are super lonely right next to the freaking parents that are overworked and overstressed and wishing someone would like, you know, help watch their kids and the grandparents in the retirement community wishing they had some kids to play with to keep them young, you know, like, you know, these types of situations are so often found throughout our, you know, dis disheveled rather culture. Um, so I remember when you were talking about the six different, you know, classes within this valley, I know that there's a need that each one of those classes have that could be met through one of the other classes. And I think that's what's going to, you know, help heal all of these value flows. Um, simultaneously, what we're doing with Regen Civics Alliance, which I can share with you a little bit about, is mm -hmm. bringing together all the organizations that are helping, i.e. SEEDS being one of them, HIFA, and so many different others. There's like 36 now. Um, that are helping at all the different levels that a project might need to actually succeed. So mm -hmm. rather than, and I think we've been doing this because capitalism teaches us to do this, is we're saying, okay, we want to birth a new civilization. But what happens when you birth a baby? Is it the heart gets ready? And then it's like, hey, the heart's ready. I can pump blood now. So I'm going to pop out of the womb. You know, like, no, that's not how it works. The heart's ready well before the other organs, but it sits mm -hmm. there and it's, you know, playing its role. It doesn't try to survive in the world on its own. But that's what we've been trying to do with every one of our startups or projects. We're like, okay, our particular organ's ready. We need to go out there and raise funds for ourselves and make it on our own. You know, that's as if every one of the organs in our body wanted to, you know, make it on their own. It just doesn't make sense. So we haven't had the, the whole organism, you know, fully fleshed out and mapped out before birthing it. We keep having these false births, just like what would happen if, yep, okay, we got the heart and lungs. Okay, we're done. Let's, you know, birth ourselves now. It's like, we keep doing that. And then we yeah. birth and we have this false birth and then we die and we're like, fuck, that was painful. Like, I don't want to do that again. It's like, <laughs> well, I mean, obviously it didn't work. Like we needed mm -hmm. all the systems in place. Mm -hmm. And if that's there, we don't have every project trying to fundraise. That's not every project's role. That doesn't make any sense. We yeah. need one organism for the ecosystem that's focused on fundraising for the whole ecosystem. That's mm -hmm. also a more complete story for investors. It's better for them. They don't want to mm -hmm. invest into a single startup or a single land-based project. That mm -hmm. also creates so many problems with land-based projects. If you have one investor that has an outsized influence on that project, that's the source of so much community conflict where that mm -hmm. investor thinks they're only there because of the money and they don't really love them or whatever, <laughs> that creates a bunch of problems and community thinks they have too much power and that creates a bunch of problems, et cetera. So that's kind of yeah. what the Region Civics Alliance is. It's cool. We need all the organs. What are they? Let's bring them all together. And then we fundraise as a whole ecosystem. And then that money is going to as many projects as can be part of this alliance. And ideally, maybe this gets to the point where there's a thousand or a million land-based projects, all part of this same alliance. So investors come in, not investing into one project, they're investing into a thousand that are backed by land where that land is being regenerated. So it's a very stable investment for them. It just makes sense. There's less risk, et cetera. So that's kind of the, the whole story we needed to weave in together mm. in order for this to work. So that's kind of where I went with region civics is what does the other side of that chasm look like? What infrastructure do we need that kind of points back? Mm. And this is kind of what I've been, you know, taking on with a bunch of awesome epic humans for the last couple of years. Mm. Um, thoughts, reflections, because I know you've been kind of playing in the same area too, hence why I think we're having this conversation. Hmm. Um, and, and so just for context to anybody who may be listening to our recording afterwards, I was involved in the seeds ecosystem early on and absolutely loved what you guys were doing. But then when you started talking about the fundraising and creating healthy value flow into the ecosystem, I must admit, I, I got a little frustrated because it wasn't moving quickly enough. There didn't seem to be enough of an interest certainly as far as healthy value flow into the ecosystem. And, and this is not a criticism of seeds. It's an observation of the entire space. Just generally, essentially, you're challenging the entire system that created wealth in the first place. And you're going against those principles and saying, well, somehow, you know, come and invest in this thing. And, and so everybody seemed to be <laughs> struggling in that space. So firstly, it was helpful for my own framing to recognize that in the rise and fall of civilizations and using the Hanseatic League as an example, you have to have an ecosystem from which value flows as this system is busy imploding. 
into mm -hmm. this system that's busy emerging. And you, you were earlier mentioning bridges, but actually it's more than a bridge. It's how do you create the mechanism by which it makes sense for those flows to happen naturally and healthily and all the rest. And that, that question has sat with me for a long, long time until mm. I recently was started. Uh, I've been very fortunate to be mentored by a high net worth individual who is not, you know, not a multi-gazillion billionaire by a long stretch of the imagination, but has connections to people who are much more wealthy than she is. And so we started conversations around what does it take to create a heart connection? Because when you go into the funding space, it's all about a business plan and what's the return and, you know, venture capital raise, which I've done a few times, is absolutely soul destroying because you have to basically whore yourself to prove to an investor that you're going to make money, more money. In other words, continue the same friggin' system that has caused the issues that we have in the first place. So it's just an, a never ending story. As you know, a debt based economic system requires constant growth and we cannot have constant growth on a planet to find out resources so we have a huge contention between some very basic economic structures uh, and the need to keep the system going and we're reaching the point now where that system cannot um, yep. a quick injection i think we can <laughs> have constant growth but a different type of growth, yes. you know, when a human grows, we reach, you know, 21, 22 or whatever, we stop physically growing, but that's when we keep mentally, spiritually, emotionally growing, hopefully, you know, like, okay. so we need to shift the, what we consider growth, you know, like some proponents have talked about, and you could do this, you could infinitely grow in the metaverse, you know, it doesn't take any more resources no, to no, create no, artificial no, no. homes there or whatever, like, you know, so, okay, fine, you can't have infinite growth if you just grow it in the metaverse or, whatever, you know, so, like, I think we can have infinite growth, um, but just shifting what it means to grow, yes, you know, completely. So growing I mean, the quality of life, growing the, you know, regeneration of the land, growing yes. the diversity yes, of species, yes. great, let's keep growing. Let's just shift that growth, you know, to something but, else. So like, your, your analogy was was physical growth, you know, up until t you're 21 or 30 or whatever years old as a physical being. And then your growth transitions into a different form. Now, our economic system, our current economic system, forget blockchain and crypto and all the rest, is not designed to support that shift in growth at all. Oh, yeah, so we are at, a, I mean, I know you know this. Um, anyhow, so, uh, where was I going with this? Okay. So what we, what I've been on a search for is high net worth individuals with a conscience and no, sorry, not with a conscience who are conscious and recognize where humanity and civilization is at mm. and want to leave a meaningful legacy that isn't stamped with what's collapsing but is stamped with the hallmarks of what's emerging and these individuals as i've come to learn there's not a huge number of them but there's a growing number of them and that's the key point um are not interested in the business case and the return on investment and all of the stuff that we've all been focused on in these regenerative projects we've been forced to consider you know what's the return when actually we want to do our friggin work without concerning ourselves with what the capital return is. Now, what these guys are particularly interesting, guys and gals, is a heart connection, a resonance, a genuine feeling of, you know, I love what you're doing. The issue is that they don't have the time to build the relationship with these individual projects and figure out what the founder is about and what their motivations are and all the rest. So they've asked us to, to come up with some kind of process that gets people to a common understanding and then writes not a business plan, but an essay that just says, this is who I'm about. This is how I, what I'm passionate about fits in with the way the human species is evolving anyway. And mm. based on the, the context of that essay, these high net worths uh, are, are willing to reach out and engage and, and do some incredible stuff. Now, for me, this is a big, big breakthrough, particularly having come through the traditional fundraising route, which 
is soul destroying as many of the people listening to this and i'm sure you would know um so it's it's early stages but that's generally what we're trying to do is create the heart connection in an as efficient manner possible between people with financial capital and people with human capital in other words they have the huge desire to do something uh, and have a, a generally well aligned way of getting there because there's lots of naivety in this space as i'm sure you know um making those connections and then making magic happen that's the outcome that we're trying to accomplish yeah i mean i love it i mean i want I, I see heart connection. I see a similarity with, you know, something I'm just hyper focused on these days because my son. Um, mm -hmm. But that's healing, and I think that's genuinely what anyone, regardless of what wealth status they have, requires today. Like we're all sick because we're all part of Earth, just like the bacterium that lives on our body. It's all part of our body. Like we're all part of Earth, and we're all sick. We all same share the same sickness, regardless of how much money you have. Uh, so I think what you're talking about, like heart connection, is I feel like. You know, I know they are because we all are. They're feeling that sickness, that illness. They're wanting mm -hmm. to do something about it um, and do something responsibly, I'm sure. So I think that's kind of the real aim here is it's none of this has to be selfless or altruistic or anything like that. It could be right. very selfish that we're here to heal. Um, yep. And healing looks like relationship. It looks like rebuilding trust. It looks like having a community that says you're not just here because you're a high net worth individual and you got a bunch of money, you know, <laughs> like that never works which is what keeps the high net worth individuals hanging out with other high net worth individuals. They don't treat them like someone else, you know? So like, it's hard to connect those two when they're seen that way. So I think that broker makes a lot of sense where the broker in the middle is the one that's, you know, doling out the money, if you will. Um, but the high net worth individuals get to connect with community and get to heal and get to be a part of it just in, you know, in the same capacity as everyone else, but they just get to support a lot of it because they've won game A, good for them, awesome. You know, thanks for helping fuel game B and your legacy is going to be so much cooler because of it. You know, that makes a lot of sense. Right. Um, simultaneously, I think I want to go even beyond just altruistic desires because what is actual value? What's actually valuable, especially in today's tumultuous times, is land and community and people connecting and meeting their needs. That's where all value stems from. So if you have an ecosystem that's you know supporting that and is backed by that, that's where all the value is. You know, gold isn't valuable. You can't eat that. It can't help you have a beautiful life. You know, Bitcoin's not valuable. Dollars isn't valuable. Stocks in some company that's going to be irrelevant is not valuable. Like certainly the petrol companies aren't valuable. Like you know, and people with a lot of pension funds money are thinking this too. Where do we put money in something that's going to be stable because we have people who are going to retire and they need to have their wealth you know so what's something stable land that's being regenerated by communities that are building relationship and meeting their needs and growing food etc so i think that whole story when it comes together is just so blatantly obvious you know at least to me uh, and i want you to tell me where it's not obvious and where it's wrong well i mean <laughs> you're you're 100 correct and then the challenge is how you know going back to this analogy of how do you create a healthy value flow out of what's collapsing into what's emerging so i was incredibly fortunate a year ago to spend a year on a biodynamic farm where the family had made the very difficult decision to remove their piece of land from the traditional real estate market and put it into a land trust now in south africa that took a fair amount of jumping through legal hoops and you know doing some pretty creative stuff um and and so now that land has been put into commons and we are now going through the process of doing the same with faith-based land with abandoned mm. state assets with um uh, traditional tribal owned land so rather than somebody trying to make a claim on that land rather than releasing it and saying we are going to put it into this land trust thing, which is a pretty unique thing. It was done by an environmental lawyer, all incredible stuff. Um, and then to say, now, what can you do as far as that land is concerned? How could that land be attractive to a high net worth individual? Not in ownership of the land, because we've removed it out of the ownership realm, 
but rather in the future potential of the land. So this is where regeneration comes in, where obviously you have the ongoing uh, records of the, the soil quality, water retention, carbon sequestration, you know, all of those good things. But you're now pinning the, the increasing value of the NFT to what is happening in the, physically in the soil. And so now you connecting by purchasing the nft you're connecting your legacy what you leave behind specifically to what is being done on the ground um so we're working with some incredible people who've done um digitization of pretty big physical assets uh, because you need when you're talking to a high net worth individual you need the credibility you need the assurance that what you're talking about is not smoke and mirrors and not pie in the sky kind of stuff so we're getting very close to something that is quite real <clears throat> and we're not the only people in the world i'm aware that many others have attempted similar things but we're talking now at scale you know we're talking hundreds of thousands of hectares uh, connecting it potentially to esg and and the kind of improvements that corporates are looking for but at a scale that hasn't yet been done as far as we're aware um and i mean showing who cares if it is being done we need a thousand million of these anyway there's a lot yes. of earth so exactly. <laughs> there's doesn't matter if there's competition or cooperation rather but anyway yeah. please go the, the big shift is in this idea of ownership so i no longer own the land but i own the stewardship rights to that land and look at what has been done on the land and that is now part of my legacy that's the thing that gets recorded in the blockchain everybody can see in perpetuity um and and that, so that's, yeah, kind that's of where a lot of interesting things you can do with that i love the concept of not owning land because that's closer to reality uh, that yep. we don't own any of this earth anyway um, mm -hmm. but i think there's a couple of ways we can get there we can get there with one we can pretend like there's an alliance like this that ends up owning all of the earth and everyone owns a share of this alliance because everyone joined it because it owns all the earth okay well now everyone owns a share of everything now no one owns anything anymore and we're right back to kind of where we started <laughs> so we can get back to you know the reality of it that no one owns anything once we yeah. all own a share of everything um so it's one way of getting there kind of going full cycle uh, I see the trust side. That's really interesting. Um, I've seen a bunch of groups in, in the Alliance. There's a bunch of groups doing a trust model or a spiritual ministry model. Yep. Yep. Um, but then the tokens are mediating access. So, I mean, which is kind of the same thing as a title. Again, you don't technically own the land. What does that even mean? If civilization collapsed, then your titles are useless anyway. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, so, for but, us the, but you can the, mediate access with it which then is where the value comes from yeah, yeah i'm not yeah. not so sure okay. about that oh yes please reflect so I, rather than having access to anything the concept of ownership transitions to stewage and so even though i don't have access to this piece of land that this nft is associated with my name is associated with the amount of regeneration and stewardship and good things that have come as a result of what we've done on the piece of land from a community perspective from a environment perspective from a water retention perspective all of those good things and and that is what i am purchasing the right to be associated with the improvement that we managed to accomplish on that piece of land. Remember that we're talking specifically from a high net worth individual perspective and a legacy perspective. Right, 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 right. In which yeah, case, I love this, and this is very complimentary. Um, I don't think it's an either or situation here. I think it's a, you know, a plurality of both and. So I would love to weave this in because currently there's a, there's a few attempts at this, but I, I see mm -hmm. and I know what you've been up to. And this is definitely the most mature, again, because and then know more of what you've been up to uh, approach here. So I'd love to have this actually be that, you know, vertical in the alliance, if you'd like, um, that is focused on high network individuals, legacy side, and not ownership, but more being able to have a claim on the regeneration that's happening to that, whether it's carbon credits or whatever. Um, that makes a lot of sense. What's happening in parallel is the access model for like eco villages. Mm -hmm. where you know if you want to literally live there with your family you might need to yeah. have a hundred thousand tokens staked or whatever it is yeah. and 
how do you get those tokens? Well, maybe you buy them, maybe you work for them, whatever. There's a million different ways they can get about getting these tokens, depending on what village it is. So I see both sides kind of being real, where you can have access mediated, and we can have... Yeah, anyway, so I see both of these being incredibly valuable and synergistic with each other. Um, if, and I think there's I a couple may, more models. Anyway. If I may add a nuance to that. So what we've discovered is that by offering access to a piece of land doesn't go sufficiently far to disconnect the thinking around ownership versus stewardship. And so we believe that the middle way, and I love your and or, I mean, you know, it, it, there's no dualism in this. We've got to provide both two ways of doing it. So what you do is you provide guaranteed access in the case of severe societal collapse. So in other words, somebody living in London or New York or whatever and needs to get out immediately and has nowhere to escape to, there's a way of offering a place for you as a temporary settlement place. Um, but you don't own, you, you, you're not coming to a piece of land to build a home in the traditional ownership sense. It's an interim temporary solution as we house you in a community that thinks very differently, specifically thinks about stewardship rather than ownership. Now, that's quite a leap for people to make, but maybe in the short term, the assurance of a place to escape to with like-minded community and all the rest is, is the end way of thinking about all of this. Yeah, I mean, and and right, because uh, that's definitely a route there. There's ten routes there. <laughs> you know? um, the I, key I thing that we're trying to do is 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 to interrupt this thinking about access and ownership and the fact that you have a physical piece of land because, as as you said, that is not how human society developed. That is a relatively new invention that you stake your claim on a piece of land. And we've seen the damage that that creates. So we're trying to shift or interrupt that thinking uh, as gently as we can. I mean, I hear you. I want, I want to provide a counter though, because this is what's pulling me. Uh, not that I care so much about ownership, but I care a lot about relationship. And that relationship with plants that you particularly grew, like you literally put them in your mouth or you put them in your body and you put them into the ground, like you connected with them. There's a special relationship that you're having and it is stewardship. It's not ownership any more than, I mean, of course, our culture came from here where men thought they owned their wives, but we're getting to a point now where it's like, actually, we don't own this other being. We're in relationship with them and that's where all the beauty comes from. Um, so I think that's where I would like to head, you know, when we're yes. looking at land, is this is land that I'm having a deep relationship with. Yep. But that's, you know, only true if someone can't, you know, come in and kick me off of it immediately, just like, you know, my wife is my wife, because the neighbor's not stealing her away every evening and you know, sleeping with her or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's not an ownership. It's a relationship that is direct with you and that is, you know, protected and mediated somehow. Um, yes cultures have gone about that in a whole bunch of different ways but then what does it also look like if you're part of a network where it's like okay i have access to this particular community where i'm growing a garden here and i have deep relationship with this land but now i'm also part of a network where there's a thousand different communities yep, and yep, the contributions yep. i'm making to this one gives me access to all thousand of those right yep. so it's still kind of a concept of like we're stewarding these and we are because as we grow value here, all of the value of the tokens or whatever we're holding are increasing in value. So now we all have the aligned incentives. This is where external incentives are still playing a role um, to take care of each other's land. Because if you own a share of everyone's land, now it's not in competition with the neighbor. Oh, they built a really cool house. Like I'm jealous of them. They built a really cool house. Now the value of this whole project has gone up. Now my tokens have gone up. I celebrate them, you know? <laughs> Like, so it's still kind of the extrinsic side of like, how do we, you know, move towards that community celebration and community taking care of the commons, yep. you know, because right now we have garbage all over highways and parks and, you know, the tragedy of the commons, which we can get into for a whole lot. But yep. if we all owned those things, now we all have that aligned incentive. Now it's like, oh no, that is my park. Now I want to take care of that because it's mine. 
you know, I think that's a still a positive step towards the reality that we are the same being as this earth, if we see ourselves as it, and ownership is one way to get there. So I think there is a really important part of like going through ownership, rather than trying to avoid it and going away from it and calling it bad, you know? So, that I, so I'm maybe, super maybe, nuanced here, but I think there's yes, a... Yes, yes. I, was, yeah. I was just going to say, to maybe add a nuance to this, if you view it through the um, uh, maturation cycle of a species, in the early stages, there's intense competition. So kind of the teenage years, lots of competition. Now, humans as a species have been through those two teenage years. And now a certain percentage of us are recognizing that the, the mature phase is collaboration. And this to me is where um, stewardship or rather ownership matures into stewardship. So in the old phase, we would take our acre of land and grow our vegetables. And yes, we'd established stewardship but it's for ourselves we are only looking after our needs and our family's needs now we're recognizing that the commons is there to serve the commons and the rest of the community that we happen to find ourselves in that's a mature way of thinking about stuff we no longer need to say this is my piece of land and it's my vegetables and you know for a non uh, for, uh, if i remember correctly you're a vegetarian but for people who raise their own animals or consumption there's an intense relationship with the animal and there's no reason why you don't do the same with vegetables but it's not your vegetables now it's you know veg it's it's food sources that ensure the health of the community that i happen to find myself in and the community is part of my own physical health because of mental well-being and all those good things so it's it's maturing to the point of looking at whole systems health more than just what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours so there's lots of interweaving themes here but uh, i think we're completely agreeing with each other just coming at it from lots of different angles well yeah and i think this is again relationship and regeneration is you know taking in all of these perspectives and say that they are all the same if you will yeah. but you know one hilarious post i saw the other day my wife showed me was someone had put up, hey, I want to sue my neighbors because every day their bees come into my yard and steal the pollen from my flowers, and go back and make honey, and then they sell that honey for profit. You know, like, this is ridiculous. You know, <laughs> like, where's my share of this? Um, simultaneously, you can imagine the inverse. You know, we have this eco-village where, yeah, you've got your hectare that you're growing your food, and it is feeding your family fine. But, you know, birds are coming in from the neighbor who just got this exotic seed, and it mm -hmm. went to seed, some birds ate it and came and pooped it in your yard and now it's growing. It's like, yep. so, you know, we do have this interrelated element that the health of our neighbor's ecosystems, you know, serve our health. You know, if they've got a bunch of pollen and they're cleaning their air, well, you're gonna breathe that air. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, I, it's, I think we're getting there, but I, I still see this as it's a both and. You know, there's the stewardship principle, but also common ownership. And I think both are necessary to, you know, appeal to all of our senses. Uh, and just in having conversations with people, you know, it's kind of like the World Economic Forum was like, you're going to own nothing and be happy. And now there's a billions of people, I swear, that, you know, just vehemently hate that phrase. I think yeah. I kind of understand where it was coming from. I don't care about the World Economic Forum. Um, but I could kind of understand where it's coming from because they're like, oh, well, all the services are going to be shared. You know, maybe in that model, one company owns it all technically, and that's awful. Um, mm. But it's still that concept. It's like, well, you know, I want to own something. I want to feel I belong. I want to feel like I, you know, have a space to call my own. And I think that's really freaking important. So I do think this idea of going through ownership to get to stewardship is, you know, kind of mandatory and it needs to, you know, incorporate each other. Uh, not have this idea of no, we don't have ownership. You don't own anything because this is all everyone's stuff. I, I think most humans are going to reject that, you know, and probably for good reason because that's very dystopic. For all the you know reasons, it would be dystopic. Um, but anyway, we got super nuanced here. But I think this is probably one of those areas where we could tease out each other's thinking. And I really appreciate the the evolution you've helped me see here. So. Hmm. Maybe if I may, just to, I know we've um, probably gone way over time, but to add, since you mentioned World, World Economic Forum, 
I think what's necessary to consider in the rise and fall of civilizations, the first observation is that only class-based civilizations rise and fall. Class-based civilization is, start, is one that starts off with the division of labor. In other words, you do this role and I do this role, and it's supposedly meant to make um, life more efficient. Extrapolated, that leads to the 1% challenge, and the 1% always end up with a hubristic kind of thinking that takes actions based on defending their wealth from mm. the masses. And so the World Economic Forum, to me, is the epitome or, or the um, uh, demonstration of that hubristic thinking. So everybody who flies into Davos is defending their 1% position in society. And we must expect that. That is how a class-based civilization works. So everything is working as designed. Nothing is broken. It's all <laughs> uh, operating as expected. The alternative, though, is a values-based society. And mm. sadly, there are very few of them. The Iroqui um, in North America was one of them. The Khoisan uh, series of tribes in Southern Africa is the longest surviving example of a values-based civilization. And they don't have classes at all. There is no hierarchy, no distinction. Mm. Um, I've lost my train of thought now because I was going somewhere with this. For me, the outcome in whatever it is that we work towards should ideally not replicate, you know, we shouldn't get to the point of sovereignty that then finally develops into another class-based civilization. If humanity is evolving and maturing and developing, we will potentially move into a values-based society, which means totally different governance systems, which we haven't fully understood. Fortunately, there are people that have done lots of work and research in this place. Um, and, and sadly, in the blockchain space, we've seen lots of replication of class-based governance systems. And, and that's to be expected because this is embedded in our DNA. We've been exposed to this for hundreds of generations. Um, but ultimately, that's where I think we, we the shift from ownership to stewardship if embedded in the idea of shifting from class-based to values-based is an incredibly powerful proposition. It's also very difficult to wrap our heads around, but ideally that's where the, for me anyway, that's the North Star. Yeah, I mean, I think you're just describing the, the guardrails of this bridge, if you will, where one side is that class-based civilization, the others is a values-based, how you traverse that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it is, you know, okay, you say values based that might not mean something, but if we talk about it in the case of like healing, okay, those one percenters are flying all into Davos for some reason, you know, mm -hmm. if they were completely whole, you know, whole humans with no concerns or worries in their life, they wouldn't bother getting on a plane and flying there to, you know, attend all those conversations unless they just want to keep stroking their ego. Um, but even their ego stroking is because they're unhealthy, you know, so yeah, you know, it's, the, it's the idea of going to this new civilization does heal all of us and we all need it. So those values are ones of healing of you know, being fulfilled humans. Um, so I think that's kind of how we traverse that bridge is like making that very clear so that the, it isn't the 99% versus the 1% to take them down to like force us to a values-based whatever. Um, yeah. Simultaneously, like this is exactly why I said seeds and a lot of the things in that movement were really rooted in the current paradigm. Because <laughs> even right. like in Haifa, like we created seven different distinct classes of different pay based on like how much you're contributing, you know, <laughs> like it was very, it was very much a class-based system, like all over again. I went yeah. and did this fast once and like, it just struck me like a light bulb, how ridiculous that was. And I was like, ah, shit, we fucked up again. No, uh, went back no, and I'm like, hey, we should have the same up. pay for everyone. And there was like this big pushback. It's like, oh no, because in all these reasons and, you know, very mm -hmm. valid points of why that couldn't work. Um, but it was just me thinking like, I wanted to teleport myself to the other side already, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's just understanding like the how the bridge works you need all of those pieces working you know, even so if the seeds and hyphen and all that and how it's working wasn't structured well then you couldn't cross the bridge and now we're back with having you know tiny islands on the other side and no way of getting across um so that's kind of yeah i, I just i'm, I'm 
teasing out the nuances of what this bridge needs to have and look like. And I think and, we've been and, playing. And nobody said it was. Game. Nobody said it was going to be easy. So. Oh, yeah. Why? Why should it be? I mean, that's part of our evolutionary journey here. If humans becoming yeah. gods, it's you know. Yeah. I'm positive at some point we're like, okay, that was fun last time around. Let's turn everything up on expert mode. Uh, collapse of civilization, collapse of the whole planet, uh, extinction of species. Everyone's polarized. We have machines manipulating us. Okay. <laughs> What's the most intense situation we can imagine that is going to force us to fundamentally evolve as humans in order to get through it um, or die trying? Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow. And, and the key is that everything you've described has happened before in history. So the mm. same level of top-down control, of course, the technology is different, but the outcome is exactly the same. The same level of um, people at the bottom getting to the point of, you know what, I'm not going to take this control anymore, and eventually doing something that evolves into something beautiful emerging. So, you know, it's easy to get caught up in individual news events and bad things going on and whatever but it's all part of a cycle um and i find that for me personally helps mm. just to calm my nerves every now and then when you think oh my god where are we going <laughs> there's no hope there is hope <clears throat> Well, and knowing that those stressed out nerves, again, are creating new types of viruses, which is new capacities that we can have. So like yes. us going through this stress is like biologically necessary in order to give us new capacities on the other side of this. So it's like, okay, there's a purpose here. <laughs> you know? So that, that, that is also helpful. And saying again, carbon, it's just plant food. You know, all these things we look at as existential problems is actually in a different lens. It's perfect. It's exactly what we need. Um, so yeah, yep, let's build that bridge. Beautiful. <laughs> well, brother, I mean, I love this. Uh, I'd well, love do you to mind if I make an end. offer to the Seeds community? I mean, I am uh, offering a program and if, if there was interest from the Seeds community, I'd love to, you know, there's, there's a cost to it, but I'm happy to seriously uh, reduce that cost if there's interest. Would you mind if I did a little bit of a punt to what I'm putting um, together? I, I wish you would. And we can upload this video and attach it to it to give a little bit more context. Um, and then if you want, maybe you can give like a 30 second overview of why they want to join that. Awesome. So appreciate that. You know, so firstly, I'm, I was very connected to the Seeds community. I recently met Danny Kilich uh, here in Cape Town, who actually came through to the valley that we're doing some stuff in. And that mm. was an unbelievably deep spiritual connection. I think she would say the same thing. Uh, I was certainly in tears a number of times during the day. Um, mm. but, but just you know, to stress that there is a bit of a connection to the Seeds community, even though I haven't been involved in quite some time and I've lost a little bit of uh, contact about how, how far you are. Um, but, but so the thing that I put together now is basically a requirement from my high net worth individual mentor who has said, bring together a community of people who we know there are lots of them working on unbelievable regenerative stuff, but we want a little bit of a filter. And we want these individuals who come together to demonstrate to us that they have an understanding of how their specific initiative fits in with the rise and fall of, and, and specifically the fall of our current globalized civilization. So that requires a little bit of a program. So I put a 30 day program together, but the output at the end of that program is that we show you how to write an essay, not a business pitch. It's got nothing to do with return on investment. It's how you demonstrate how your heart resonance connects with the heart resonance of these very scarce and rare high net worth individuals that understand where we're at. And that network will grow over time. At the moment, I admit it's very, very small. So it's an invitation uh, to come through that program to figure out how we do this, to figure out how we connect with them. The current cost for Global North is $2.95 for that. There's a discount code if you write this down, seeds in uppercase 2023, 2023, and that'll reduce the cost of the program down to $95, which I hope oh. is a reasonable amount. And if you 
for those listening to it, if that even if even that amount is too much for you, but you feel a resonance for what we've discussed here and would still like to, to come along, there's um, a scholarship program and the details are in the little bit of a video, which we'll either include in the link or if I just verbally give it, it's lifelegacyai.com but then slash beta because this is a beta program and there's a 20 minute uh, video overview there but uh, hopefully we can can include the links here so you don't have to remember too much uh, about this of but I'd be happy to see some seat people in there reconnect with some people that I've maybe lost uh, some contact with over the years um and we'll see where this goes i'm i'm quietly very confident that this is going to open some incredible doors it already has uh from a serendipitous point of view mm. and very keen to see what kind of truly interesting projects come into this ecosystem as well as the you know existing seeds ecosystem i've always been impressed with what you pulled together there um, and at the end of the day, we just want to see a vibrant world, a regenerated world. We all in this together, you know, we already know the outcome that we want. We're hopefully playing a role in making that outcome a little bit easier to accomplish by introducing a healthy inflow of, of capital from high net worth individuals. That's my pitch. I'll wrap up there. I, yeah, I mean, I love that pitch and I love the reframing. I mean, we, if we keep framing all of our projects in the same lens that created the problems, i.e. what's the return on investment, et cetera, et cetera, like going to keep ending up in the same places. So exactly. obviously there's a lot of high net worth individuals with a lot of time to fully understand the predicament that we're in. And they probably understand the ridiculousness of continuing to invest in the problem. So exactly. I love you taking the, you know, the front here and leading in this and it makes a lot of sense. So incredibly beautiful. Um, Michael, I love connecting with you and you're just as part of Seeds as anyone else. No one's had the capacity to stay in the ecosystem full time, including myself. So you know, that doesn't mean we're not all still connected and part of this. So, you know, don't be too modest. You've been in so much of this and it's beautiful and your wisdom flows throughout a lot of it. Um, I promise you that. Oh, wow. uh, I love you, brother. I love everything you're up to. And yeah, let's, let's keep playing. Thanks for holding the vision. I've um, watched your tenacity over many years. Um, I know this hasn't been easy going uh, you know, for all of the time, there have been good times and bad times for all of us. But uh, appreciate your commitment to all of this and the Seeds community. It's been a beautiful space for me to be involved with. Um, look forward to more. Yeah, uh, last thing I want to leave you with is when we're changing extrinsic incentives to intrinsic, um, we actually can get rid of this concept of failure because if all of our gatherings and all of our comings togethers help us heal and help us understand more about ourselves and that journey, then the, it doesn't need to achieve anything in particular. There's no concept of a failed project because the entire process was inherently rewarding. <laughs> Um, so if we're engaged in that, then we can actually completely remove this concept. Um, but if our yeah. concept is always, you know, we have to get this project off the ground and have self-sufficiency or whatever, and if we attempt it and we failed, then we failed and we wasted all that time. I think that's all entrenched in the old paradigm still. Um, so there's a way of hacking it. That's, you know, even attending these sessions, it's inherently worth it, right? Um, anyway, brother, yeah. I, I love this. You're incredible. And uh Till next time. Great stuff. Unless Thank there's you, anything Michael. else you want to share. No, that's it. Beautiful. Thank <laughs> you for spending the time with me. I've really enjoyed this. Yeah, likewise. Cheers, brother. Great stuff. Go well. Bye-bye. Mm.